Westmoreland Community Connections is a presentation of Citizens Fiber. Welcome to Westmoreland Community Connections, a look at issues and happenings on Classic Hits 107.1 WHJB. Here now is your host, Chad Ammon, President and CEO of the Westmoreland County Chamber of Commerce. Hey, it's Laura Kay from the WHJB Morning Show with a special segment of Westmoreland Community Connections. And today I'm going to be talking with Dan Tobin, the Director of Communications at the American Cancer Society. Now, in case you don't realize, my dear listener, what they're all about, they're a nationwide voluntary health organization, and they're dedicated to eliminating cancer. They were established back in 1913, organized into six geographical regions. Both medical and lay volunteers operate in more than 250 regional offices throughout the U.S. Now, its global headquarters is located in the American Cancer Society Center in Atlanta, Georgia. It was founded in May of 1913, and who founded it? Ten physicians and five Five businessmen in New York City under the name American Society for the Control of Cancer, or the ASCC. Now, the current name, American Cancer Society, was adopted in 1944. So just a little bit of background information for you on the American Cancer Society. And without further ado, I'm going to get to talking with my guest today, Mr. Dan Tobin, the Director of Communications. And welcome, Dan. Thanks for being with me today. Well, thank you for having me. And wow, that was a great history on us. That was awesome. (laughs) I did my homework. You really did. (laughs) I did. So now I want you to tell me uh, from your perspective, what is the American Cancer Society? And I know there's a lot to that question, but go ahead. You know, I think our mission statement really sums it up. The American Cancer Society, we aim to save lives, to celebrate lives, and we want to be the leader in the fight for a world without cancer. You know, let's face it, all of us have been touched by cancer, either directly or indirectly, and uh, it is such a traumatic situation for people and for families, and we're hoping to, to get to a point that nobody ever has to hear those words you have cancer. Well, and and you're right. We are all touched by that. Uh, my, my father passed away from cancer uh, about six years ago now, and uh, we just actually, unfortunately, lost one of our members of the WHJB family to cancer as well uh, in June. So, yes, we've been touched by that. How many people in the U.S. are diagnosed with cancer? On average, one in three people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. And uh, the leading cause of cancer death in America is lung cancer. What's amazing about that, the second, third, and fourth leading causes. So in in men, the second leading cause is prostate cancer, and in women, it's breast cancer. Third and fourth in both men and women are colon and uh, pancreatic cancer. If you combine all those deaths from all those other cancers, lung cancer is still accounts for more deaths than all the others combined. Wow. So it is is definitely the, um, you know, a very prevalent cancer in our society. Now, you have seen uh, a lot, I'm sure, over the years that you've been established in the U.S. You've seen cancer rates rise and drop. Where are we right now? Uh, Since 1991, we've seen the mortality rate from cancer drop by 27 percent, which is phenomenal. And, you know, our goal is obviously to see that go down even further uh, as as the years progress. And that can be done. It It can be done through education, it can be done through um, prevention. It can be done through screenings. So uh, we'll get there. You know, we'll, we'll get there uh, working together. And when you talk about screenings, we're going to talk a little bit later about the COVID-19 and screenings as well, because uh, it's had an, its, its effect on every portion and every part of our life. Uh, so what exactly now does the American Cancer Society do? That is a great question. And I know when I came to the American Cancer Society, I had no idea of everything that, that really we're part of. You know, essentially, we serve, we serve patients, we serve their families, and we serve the caregivers. And we do that through research, through education, through advocacy, and through patient services. I think the big thing that people know us for is our research. What I don't think people realize is we are the largest non-government funder of cancer research in the United States. Uh, since 1946, $4.9 billion, that's B, a billion dollars, we have um, invested in cancer research for things related to de- detection, prevention, and treatments. Uh, we have been part of almost every major cancer discovery, uh, and that's pretty cool. Education. 
the public needs to be educated about cancer risk. Well, let's face it, anybody can get cancer, but there are definitely things you can do to mitigate those that risk a little bit. And we want to make sure we educate folks on those as well as um, educate them on the advantages of early detection. Advocacy. We have an, uh, we call it our affiliate organization, American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. And this organization works with our elected officials and to bring a voice on matters related to cancer and health equity uh, in front of, you know, put that in front of our political leaders and hopefully to enact positive change. The other area then is patient services. And uh, the biggest thing on a patient services is our 24-7 hotline. We have a phone number. It's 800-227-2345. If you're looking for information on cancer, whether it's for yourself, for a family member, for somebody you're taking care of, you can call that number 24-7 and receive information from our support specialist. You can also get a lot of that information online through our website at cancer.org. Other things we do, uh, there, are, there are quite a few, but the two that I'll point out are our Road to Recovery program and our Hope Lodge program. Now, let me preface this with both of these programs are currently paused because of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. But let me explain what they are. We found that the biggest barrier people have to treatment is getting to treatment. A lot of people don't have transportation, uh, and the, the reasons vary. But in some cases, you know, they can't drive themselves because of the treatments. But in order for a loved one to take them, a loved one would have to, you know, take off work, and you can only take off so many days of work. So the Road to Recovery program is where we have volunteer drivers that will supply rides to and from treatment for patients that are in need. I didn't Another know issue- that. I, I, yeah. I mean, that's good to know. I, I'm learning so much from you <laughs> on this. <laughs> and you're right. Some people, we take for granted that we all have cars and we can just jump in our car and go where we need to go. But a lot of people don't have that option. Yep. And even if you have a car, I mean, because of the treatment you're having, you might not be able to drive. That's uh, true. At a give, given time. And so, you know, this is a great service. Many of our drivers are cancer survivors. So oh, not wow. only are you getting a ride, but you're getting a ride from somebody who can relate to, to what you're going through. That's wonderful. And they're giving back to their community and helping out the people who help them. That's fantastic. Exactly. It, is, it is just a wonderful program. As I said, it's currently paused. And be, due to COVID, there's just no safe way right now to do it. But it, it will come back as soon as, you know, we get through this virus issue. Right. Um, the other issue or the other program I wanted to bring up is our Hope Lodge program. For some, treatments are many, many miles away from their home. And they required a stay in another city. And in, uh, in about 30 cities in the country, uh, we have what's called the Hope Lodges. And they are houses that we run, facilities we run, where we will provide um, free places to stay for cancer patients and their caregivers during their treatments. And um, as I said, they're, they're scattered throughout the country, so they're not in every city. But those, those are options for folks who do have to travel far for treatments. That's wonderful. And again, I'm going to give that 800 number uh, to our listeners uh, for uh, seeking who are seeking information on any of the things that we've talked about so far. It's 1-800-227-2345. And uh, please make sure that you utilize that phone number. Now, Dan, we have uh, mentioned COVID several times this morning. What impact has it had on the American Cancer Society? Uh, It's had actually a devastating impact. This is the... uh this is the biggest threat to our mission that we've ever seen in our history. Boy, I guess the basic way to, to start is um, we rely on grassroots fundraising efforts to, to provide the money for the research, for the programs we run. And a lot of those grassroots efforts are through things such as our Relay for Life events, which happen in the spring, mm-hmm. and our Making Strides Against Breast Cancer events in the fall. We also have real men who are pink campaigns and things such as that. Well, as you can imagine, those events have all been canceled this year. Right. You know, we, there was just no way to do that safely. So what we have done whenever possible 
is we have turned events into either virtual events or some sort of drive-through events, and you're seeing more drive-throughs now. We were more virtual early on. Now we're getting more drive-through. But anyways, what, what the impact of that is, is we're predicting a roughly $200 million uh, budget gap. Oh, my. Year. Yeah, it is, it is really, it, it's, just, it's just devastating all the way around. You know, like all nonprofits and other businesses, you know, we've taken a pretty big hit. What we have done to try to, um, you know, stem the flow, so to speak, uh, we have made a lot of cuts, both to personnel and non-personnel expenses. Uh, last month, we laid off a quarter of our workforce, mm. which is about a 1,000 uh, people. Those of us who remain, uh, we all took we all took pay cuts as well as benefit cuts uh, to you know to hold back. Uh, our offices are all closed. They've been closed since the pandemic started. A lot of them will not reopen. We have realized that we can work remotely and we can do it quite effectively. So we will be getting rid of a lot of our brick and mortar buildings, which will also be a huge savings to the budget in, in the process. What we haven't touched yet is research. We have made sure that we are funding our research grants that are out there because it's so important. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's something you really don't want to uh, bring down in any sense of the word. Uh, You want to push forward with that. But I see that ACS has learned, as most of us have now, that there are ways that we must adapt and change uh, in our world right now. And whether these changes will be permanent or whether they will be temporary, uh, we have to problem solve. And it sounds like you're doing that uh, and keeping the most important functions of ACS going. Uh, but what is your biggest fear now going into the fall? Because now we're in August. So what's ahead? You, that's, you know, that's a very good question. Two things are ahead. Number one, we're getting ready to start our um, Making Strides Against Breast Cancer season, which is another huge event season. Obviously, the big in-person events are not going to happen in the same format that they once that they did it last year. So we're looking at creative ways to do to do those events, um, you know, to get us to you know people excited to still fund the mission. Mm-hmm. Our biggest fear is if we cannot bring in the money and raise the money needed to fund the mission, our fear is that we're going to have to cut some of our research funding, and we might have to cut it up to 50%. Oh, wow. That that would be devastating. It would be devastating. You know, I, I don't think people realize that scientists who are starting research today, they're working on that breakthrough that may not come to complete fruition to 10 to 20 years from now through all that, you know, all that research that happens. But if we pause some of that research today, it's going to have an impact for years to come. Yes. On, on new treatments and, and, and things such as that. So we are hoping we do not have to do that. That is obviously one of the things, as I said, that so far has not been touched. But we're really getting to the point where it's the only thing left to touch. Uh, should we not be able to raise the cash that we need this year uh, to keep that floating? And it's really hard uh, to to put the focus on every nonprofit and every business that's in trouble now. Uh, it, it always used to be quite a challenge, but now we have almost everyone affected by this, and we're looking for people who are thinking and keeping you in their mind and donating to the cause and helping you out, and we need that more than ever now. You know, you're right. It's It's really about funding the mission. What I've said to a few people I know is find your passion. I, I'm very passionate about the American Cancer Society, and I hope you will be passionate about the American Cancer Society, too. But now more than ever, find that passion, whatever that passion is, and go out and support them. Uh, whether it's fundraising, whether it's volunteering, whatever the case may be, now more than ever, nonprofits need your help, and uh, you can really make a difference in your own community and the lives of other people. Well, that is great advice, and uh, that is coming from Dan Tobin, the Director of Communications from the American Cancer Society. My interview with Dan is uh, going to continue after this short message. 
This is Westmoreland Community Connections on Classic Hits 107.1 WHJB. If you have a suggestion for a topic or if your nonprofit organization would like to be featured on this program, call us during regular business hours at 724-216-1200. Westmoreland Community Connections is a presentation of Citizens Fiber. Laura Kay and I'm back. Uh, with my interview with Dan Tobin, the Director of Communications for the American Cancer Society. And again, thank you for being with me today, Dan. You're uh, providing a lot of information for our listeners. Uh, thank you. This, this, this is a great chance for us to share, you know, share a little bit about the American Cancer Society, and I really welcome um, this opportunity. Oh, yeah, you're, you're quite welcome. I love to share that as well. Now, outside, we, we were talking the last time we, we talked was about COVID-19 and the effect it's had uh, on ACS. Now, outside of that direct impact, how has it affected cancer patients and cancer care? What are you seeing? A few things. For cancer patients, um, I, I think it's twofold. The first part is cancer patients always are a little more cautious. You know, their, their systems are already compromised. So they always are uh, taking extra precautions to keep themselves healthy. What COVID-19 did was it added a a little bit more of a stress level to that. You know, what else can they do to stay healthy because of the impact that could have on them? In fact, throughout the spring, 80% of our call volume to our call center were were for questions specifically related to COVID-19 and cancer. 80%. 80%. I mean, that's a huge amount that happened because, you know, people were obviously and understandably concerned. The, the other thing that, that we saw happening, and not for everybody, but for a lot of people, were their treatments were either paused or completely postponed during, mm. you know, during it. I mean, understandably, hospitals had to, you know, shut down some things, you know, for safety. And unfortunately for some cancer patients, what was shut down was their ability to get their treatments. And that's, not, I mean, that's never good. It, once they're on a treatment regimen, they, they need to keep that up and keep going. So the, the goal is now for those patients is to get back on, on schedule as quickly as possible. Uh, so, th- so there's no long-term impact from that. Right. And, and I never actually thought about that. I think we just take for granted that things, some things continued anyway, even, uh, you know, because even uh, aside from the COVID-19, but uh, I can see what you're saying. And a lot of people probably a little bit tentative about walking into uh, their treatment centers because of what was going on. Exactly. I mean, during the middle of uh, COVID-19, I had, so my entire life, I've had one filling, one cavity. It decided to fall out. (laughs) I had to go an emergency dentist appointment. It was the wildest experience going in and all the things you had to do to get in there. And it's, yes. it was actually a little frightening. And that was just me getting a cavity filled. You know, I can't imagine what, uh, what, what these folks who would need to go for their treatments were feeling as they were going through that. And not only people who uh, are already in treatment programs, but people who are looking for early detection signs, which is so key to cancer treatment. So if you have uh, any of your routine or your exam postponed, uh, what should people be doing right now? They should be working to get those rescheduled because, as you just said, the biggest thing to, to you know help with a successful outcome is early detection. And just like treatments were paused, so many people had their routine screenings paused, things like mammographies and colonoscopies. You know, once again, it is so vital to have those screenings because an early detection can lead to a better outcome. Um, The one thing you'll see if you look at stats from the spring, you'll see that cancer diagnosis rates are down this year. Well, I don't think they're not down because cancer is going away. They're down because people weren't having their screenings done. Mm, That's disturbing. And that's not a good statistic, although at the outset, people might think that's a positive. But when we think about the details about what's really going on, uh, that's something that we really need to focus on. Yeah, it's time for folks, you know, call your doctors and work with your medical institutes institutions to uh, get them rescheduled. You know, things are opening back up. 
uh, if you really do want to want to get those scheduled. You know, none of us likes going for those routine screenings and exams, but it, it could literally save your life. Now, we're uh, speaking of opening up, we're talking now about school starting up again and students going back to the classrooms. What should people know about that coming from the American Cancer Society? You know, one of the, the best things I think a parent can do when they're talking with their pediatricians and doctors for their kids, especially kids between the ages of 9 and 12, is to talk about the HPV vaccine. And tell us what, that's, what that is, Dan. So roughly every year, 14 million people in the United States become infected with HPV. There is no cure, but there, there, is, a, there is a way to hopefully prevent it. Eight in 10 people will get this virus in their lifetime. HPV can cause uh, up to six different types of cancer later in life. 35,000 people every year are diagnosed with one of those cancers that can be linked to HPV. So getting that vaccine as a, as a child can potentially save you from getting an HPV-related cancer later in life. Okay, so wow. Uh, I, now, again, this is something that I, I never thought of. So, yeah, and you, you and figure this is, when we were that age, the vaccine didn't exist. Right. So that's right. It's, so it's new, you know, or newer. It's not, you know, brand new, obviously, but it, but it wasn't there for us. And, but now there's a way to, you know, to prevent it. And not just us with the American Cancer Society, but the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics, all of us recommend getting your children aged 9 through 12 vaccinated for HPV. Okay. All right, listeners, you, you got that, hopefully. And uh, such, such important information, especially as we uh, talk about reopening schools now. Um, you know, at the time, uh, a, little, a little bit of history again. Uh, pardon me, Dan, but uh, I did want to share this because this really surprised me. At the time that the American Cancer Society was founded, it was not even considered appropriate to mention the word cancer in public. So information about the illness was kind of kept hush-hush. Uh, and there was a lot of fear and denial. So over 75,000 people died every year of cancer in uh, just in the United States. So at the top of the list uh, of the agenda of the founders of the ACS was funding research. So they put together a writing campaign to educate doctors, nurses, patients, and family members about cancer, and they published uh, articles, popular magazines, professional journals, and then they started recruiting doctors from all over the U.S. to help educate the public about cancer. And that was back then. But now, Dan, what do you think is the biggest barrier to people being diagnosed with cancer? The biggest is uh, health equity. You know, I, I think a lot of times people confuse the terms equity and equality. And equity is making sure people have what, what they need. And that can be, that's different for different people. What we know is cancer affects everyone, but it doesn't affect everyone equally. There's all kinds of statistics out there that show that some minority populations, as well as people who lack health insurance or proper health insurance, they're more, they're more likely to develop cancer and die from it than, than the general population. So there's this unequal uh, burden of cancer and getting the you know, potentially life-saving screenings. So what we do at the American Cancer Society is twofold. One, we work with community partners to try to, to educate underserved communities and to make sure they can get the screenings they need. Two, our, our uh, Cancer Action Network works with politicians and our elected officials to hopefully, hopefully bring um, issues related to health equity to the forefront so we can level that playing field between all communities. Wow. Okay. So uh, that's a twofold process. And, and you know what's funny is you were talking about um, people getting routine exams. And I was thinking that I know a couple people that sometimes when they have symptoms of something, they're actually afraid to go and find out what is wrong, especially if they have cancer diagnosis in their ancestry. Have you run into that? I'm sure you have. Oh, yeah. I've run into it, you know, in my own family, but also, you know, in general. 
there, there's people would have this. Well, I, I, I'd rather not know. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. And and yeah, and you're scared, or you know, it's like, well, a colonoscopy. You know, it's oh, I, I don't like doing the prep, or or whatever. You know, it is that you say that you have these excuses for not going. You know, you're not going. You know, as we said before, it it really can mean the difference between life and death. Because if you do have something developing, it is much better to catch it early when it's more treatable, uh, and it's more treatable less evasively as well uh, than it is when it's later stage and it's already spread and it becomes a much harder to deal with at that point. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Well, um, we've had uh, you've answered a lot of questions for me, but if somebody uh, doesn't have their questions answered and they want to learn more about what the American Cancer Society does, where should they turn? There's a few different places. Uh, one, if you if you like going on the web, go to cancer.org. That is our website. Uh, there's literally an A to Z section that talks about all the different types of cancer has all sorts of resources. If you want to talk to one of our uh, folks with the hotline, or if you're trying to reach somebody at any of our local areas, the best number is our national toll-free number to use, which is 800-227-2345. As I said, not only do you have access to the hotline through there, but you can also get down to the local level. So Uh, they'll connect you with uh, whoever you're interested in talking to. Exactly. And if you want to get involved, you know, I I hope, you know, as I was saying before, find your passion. I hope you'll find your passion is the American Cancer Society, and you'll want to get involved with us. By using that phone number or that website, you can get involved, and you can make a difference in your community. Now, uh, for people who like social media, can they find you as well? You sure can. On Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, We can be found at ACS Pennsylvania. Okay, so a lot of different ways to connect with the American Cancer Society. And uh, just as kind of a, uh, this is an interesting thing, and I just brought this up, because I was looking at the symbol for the American Cancer Society, and uh, we all know it's a sword with a snake wrapped around it, and that was adopted in 1928, uh, designed by uh, George Durant of Brooklyn, New York, and uh, there was two serpents forming the handle, and that represents one, the scientific, and uh, one, the medical focus, and then the blade is the crusading spirit of the cancer control movement. And I just love that. I, I never knew that before. I, I got I to be honest with you. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> so look, you taught me a whole lot, and I taught you one little tiny thing. <laughs> you, you definitely did. That's, that is great. <laughs> So uh, now, Dan, how long have you been the Director of Communications at the ACS? I've only been with ACS uh, for the last year, so relatively new to ACS. Okay, wow. Well, we hope you stay. I I hope to stay. You know, it is a really great organization. As I said before, you know, cancer has touched my life. My mom's had it twice. Mm. Uh, Thank God, survived both times. One of my childhood friends passed away from it two years ago. You know, other members of my family have fought cancer over the years. So it it is personal, and I want to do what I can to hopefully be making a difference in the community, and this is, I just think, a great organization in which to make that difference. Now, is that what prompted you to become part of the ACS, is the family history? You know, I think the mission in general did. Okay. I spent most of my career in nonprofit, and I love love the mission of, of places, and the mission of the ACS definitely means a lot to me, and it does, you know, definitely help that... You know, I'm tied to it because of the family. I even look at my mom's two cancers were seven years apart, and it was the same cancer. It was lung cancer both times. Mm. I look at the changes in just seven years of how she was treated the first time to the second. And I don't mean treated poorly or great. She yes, medically. Treatment. Yes. I mean, yeah, the, just the advances in, the, in the, the treatments over seven years were pretty cool. And a lot of those treatments and those advances, once again, can go back to things related to ACS. And uh, to me, to be able to work for an organization that can have such an impact on my loved one's lives and who knows one day, possibly my own life, 
that to me is a worthwhile way to spend a career. Oh, that's a wonderful sentiment and a wonderful mission. And I assume now, Dan, that you get tested regularly. I do. I do all the all the screenings that that I need to have done. So you know, I live that mantra as as well, just to make sure that uh, if anything's going to get caught, let it get caught early, as opposed to later. Yeah, and that's a great way to uh, kind of wrap up our interview. I'm going to give you, uh, my dear listeners, the National Cancer Information Center hotline one more time. This is open 24-7 and available to you. And uh, not only is it national, but they will uh, put you on a local level of who you need to talk to. It's 1-800-227-2345. That's 1-800-227-2345. Laura Kay from the WHJB Morning Show. And uh, I've had the pleasure today of speaking with Dan Tobin, the Director of Communications from the American Cancer Society. Thank you so much, Dan, for your time today. And I know this is going to provide a lot of pertinent uh, and very important information to our listeners. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This has been awesome. Thank you. And this is Classic Hits, 107.1 WHJB. This has been Westmoreland Community Connections, a look at issues and happenings in and around Westmoreland County. Join us again next week on Classic Hits 107.1 WHJB. Westmoreland Community Connections is a presentation of Citizens Fiber. Of Citizens Fiber. Of Citizens Fiber. Of Citizens Fiber.